Welcome back. Session two tackles the topic of decolonizing aesthetics in contemporary African art. It is impossible to discuss contemporary African aesthetics without addressing the impact of colonialism, as well as decolonialism and postcolonialism. Until very recently, the Western world held tight expectations for artists from Africa and the African diaspora to produce work falling into narrow categories of aesthetics. Often artworks produced by Africans were expected to maintain close ties to, to, to traditional arts and cultural practices. As collectors, galleries, and scholars have embraced a wide variety of aesthetic production from contemporary African artists, the variety of artwork being shown is expanding exponentially. This panel will examine the changing aesthetics in contemporary African art and the promise of an African canon which is divorced from Eurocentric expectations. The session moderator is Echo Oshun, chairman of the Fourth Plinth Commissioning Group, overseeing the most prestigious public art program in the UK and the former director of the ICA London. He is the author of Africa State of Mind, nominated for the Lucy Photo Book Prize and, Gold, and Black Gold of the Sun, nominated for the Orwell Prize. He is the recipient of an honorary doctorate from London Metropolitan University. Joining ECHO is Natasha Becker. Born and raised in South Africa, Natasha is the inaugural curator of African art at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco joining the museums in December of 2020. Working in both Cape Town, South Africa and New York over the past decade, she has focused on presenting the work of African artists, African-American artists and artists of the African diaspora, organizing numerous exhibitions and international initiatives. Natasha holds a master's in African history from the University of the Western Cape, Cape Town, South Africa and studied art history at Binghamton University in New York. We're also joined by Moyo Okadiji, an art historian, artist, and curator. Moyo is currently a professor of art and art history with the focus of African art at the University of Texas, Austin. He studied fine arts at the University of Ife before proceeding, proceeding to the University of Benin where he completed an MFA in African art criticism, poetry, and painting. At the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he received a PhD in African arts and diaspora visual cultures. Moyo is a highly sought after artist and the author of books and exhibition catalogs, including African Renaissance, Old Forms, New Images in Yoruba Art, and The Shattered Gourd, Yoruba Forms and 20th Century American Art. Over to you, Echo. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, this is our panel, Decolonizing Aesthetics in Contemporary African Art, with uh, Moyu Ekadiji and Natasha Becker, myself, Echo Eshen. And look, let's just get right down to it. Because to some extent, it's a kind of simple and simultaneously complicated topic. But let me start with the basics. I look to both of you as scholars, as thinkers, as people who've thought and worked really hard uh, in this territory in terms of expanding some of the discourse around contemporary African art. But let's start with the basics. Let's ask, what do we mean when we talk about contemporary African art? What is it, if we can say, that perhaps defines work as African art other than the personal origins of, of artists themselves? Yes. Uh, I, I would say that uh, I, I'm uncomfortable with the term uh, contemporary or modern African art uh, for several reasons. And um, I, I remember when I was asked to address the topic in 1999, I believe, uh, at the Akasa meeting in uh, uh, New Orleans. I, I, I called, I, I, my, my, my topic was uh, downloading an invisible canon. And uh, why I said that is that um, 
the the idea of uh, contemporary or modern is another term or, or these are terms imposed externally on African art and uh, um, the the when that then happens, it becomes almost like a controlling tactic, just another tactic to uh, control the discourse. Um, and uh, um, this is not the way we think about art in Africa um, uh, from time immemorial. We do not have such terms. We do have terms that describe us uh, in indigenous language. For instance, um, modernity in my language means olaju. Olaju uh, implies to open your eyes and since we have this term uh, and we've been using it for hundreds of years how is it then suddenly new because the west came to to the term um, at the beginning of uh, the uh, 20th century late 19th century does it then mean that that is when uh, it's happening for us as well? So that's why it's so complicated to 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 accept, really, um, unless we just want to read what has been written in the book for us. I suppose there's a distinction you can make between African art, art from Africa and art by African artists who might be based anywhere in the world. Um, but uh, Natasha, in terms of Moyo's point, does that resonate with you? Agree, where do you, where do you, where do you say? I mean, I, I would agree with Moyo that, um, you know, while, while I understand the question is, a, is you know, it's one of the, um, sort of three main philosophical questions that one could ask. It's a type of inquiry, you know, what is something? What is um, Africa? What is African art? What is knowledge, right? Um, and that, you know, that the question stems from wanting to know, you know, how exactly can we know anything? How exactly can we know um, uh, whether... Um, this is contemporary, whether this is African, and so forth. And that question relies on this um, relationship between, you know, what is internal, what is, you know, internal in a kind of, in, in the sense of one's, you know, mentality or experience, um, and what is external, you know, uh, in, the, in the world, and what, um, and, and how that, corresponds to a kind of state, you know, of the world. And so I think that if we take that tension between the internal and external, um, you know, African art has always been contemporary and Africa has always been contemporary in, in, in the sense that African artists have always been part of a, a creative world and Africa has been part of world history and, um, uh, you know, world relations and, and, and the global, you know, um, contemporary. And so that, I would say, is, 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 has been both an internal and an external situation, you know. Um, but when Moyo talks about, you know, the invisible canon, he brings up an important point about, you know who is um, uh, who is seeing, who is naming, who is you know not seeing, who is not naming, and I think that brings up Africa's relationship to um, you know to the West, to Europe, 
um, predominantly and uh, you know and today to Asia to Latin America etc and so you know I think that um, this discussion around invisible canons and uh, you know identifying also pivots on recognition you know um, and how that recognition um, happens. So, you know, there are um, obviously different modalities, whether you are, you know, in Africa and speaking from a kind of local or regional or national perspective. Um, and then, you know, when artists transition into the international arena and into the global arena, and that's a, you know, different kind of um, visibility and uh, you know set of relations that 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 triggers. So you know while I think it's it's sort of it's productive to have that philosophical inquiry, I also think that um, that these you know these questions around term terminology like you know whether it's modern or contemporary, whether it's primitive or traditional, whether it's developed and underdeveloped. Um, you know, third world or first world, I think these are temporal concepts. And, you know, and as temporal concepts, they are categories of thought. And sometimes they are categories of Western thought. And sometimes, as Moya also pointed out, they are categories of African thought, you know. Um, I always look to the artists and I, you know, always look to um, the, the artistic practices and the aesthetic strategies that artists are wanting to articulate um, as a way to, you know, answer the bigger questions or, you know, as a way to tease out um, some of these questions. And the question around what is African art, what is um, contemporary is both a, also a question about identity and also then a question about temporality, you know. And so I think that, um, that again, those are sort of two directions, but I think that looking at specific artists and, you know, what their thoughts are about identity and what their strategies, aesthetic strategies are that they are drawing on to um, create work, um, you know, and where the, and where and how that work um, intervenes in art history or in exhibitions or in public, um, you know, culture uh, or in the art market is, you know, a whole nother separate sort of set of circumstances. So it's not exactly an answer to the question. It's it's more way of saying that it's. Um, that I think the question opens up, you know, all these I, possibilities. Yeah, I actually think it's, it's a very good answer to that question in terms of absolutely opening up this territory. And I suppose I would say it's a kind of fairly naive proposition as a question in the first place, because to some extent we've been going back and forth with this question about Africanness, the Africanness of African art. Otherwise, as Moya says, for a hundred years or more, in fact, since the apparent discovery of African art in the West, I suppose partly what I'm thinking about, and I'm interested in, in one of the, the points you make made at the end there, Natasha, about uh, the answers, as it were, or at least the explorations of these uh, taking place within the work of different artists. I'm interested if we look at, I suppose, the uh the prominence of a range of different artists of african origin in the international art world currently we can talk about Rangechi mutu or interjeka or Akinuli crosby or john comfer or michael armitage inka shenabara Zinam sudira you know all these figures whose works are actually you know fantastically complex in all sorts of ways but i guess one of the questions i'd ask there is what's the impact of artists like these, what's the impact of artists like these on the 
Western canon, if we talk about the kind of invisibility and the historic overlooking of African art and African artists, what impact are artists like this having on on the Western canon? Well, <clears throat> um, Basquiat did a painting uh, titled um, Olympia, uh, uh, in, in which he was looking at uh, the the work of uh, um, uh, Manet, Olympia, and um, what he does what, what he does in the painting is to totally remove Olympia from the foreground, uh, and to just focus on the black maid, um, and and I think that's the that's what uh, all these terms basically do. Um, in, in terms of uh, visibility, they place the, the West in front and then place the others in the background. And um, a, a, uh, a professor at uh, Amherst, Roland Abiodun, um, did a paper, I can't remember the title of the paper now, but um, um, in that paper, he was talking about uh, the relationship between him and his wife, who is a white woman, when they stand in front of the Polaroid, the, the instant camera. Um, the, this, this was uh, at the time when these instant cameras were just coming out. And um, he said, uh, when he posed with his wife and they took a picture, his wife would show very clearly. And the only way anybody would see him is if he's smiling and has his teeth out and people can see that white, those white teeth, everything else is just black. So that's why I brought out a relationship between Manet's Olympia and Basquiat's Olympia and the need for Basquiat to totally cut off uh, uh, Olympia from the, from the canvas, from the composition, so that uh, the maid can actually be visible. Uh, and that is what those terms have actually done for, for Africa, for, for people of color generally. This way in which they render, they, 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 they are these Polaroid cameras that totally subordinate everybody else. Because when, when you start talking about modernity, um, and uh, uh, you suddenly bring that conversation to Africa, and you've been discuss you've been discussing this thing for quite a while back, but suddenly you bring Africa into it, you then become the teacher, and Africa becomes the student. You begin to tell us what this means and what that doesn't mean, and that immediately subordinates all of the discourse, all of the art, all of uh, the intellectual interactions that have been taking place in Africa for thousands of years. And uh, gradually, then you begin to bring in the Shonibares um, and the Wangechi Mutu and uh, Jijuli Meretus but they are still in the background. If you, if if I'm making any sense at all, you're def you're definitely making sense. Uh, what's happened? Oh, there was Natasha. Yeah, I, I mean, look. So, uh, Natasha, I suppose that I mean, I'd ask the, I'd ask the same question that, yeah. that that Moya was expanding on. Is there a chain? You know, the, I mean, we talk about the Western canon. I mean, this is you know hundreds of years in the making, and so on and so on. Does the prominence and the significance of a number of African artists in the current period 
does that phantom TV change that? Or as Moyo says, are they still in the background? Are they still just a bit more visible? Are black artists and African artists just a bit more visible today through their efforts? Are they still not in the same place, I suppose, is kind of... Uh... Um, I would say, um, I mean, I would... Um... I would take what Moyo is saying much further. I, I, I agree that it may have been about visibility in the beginning, but I think that what African art actually has always done is explode Western canonization and explode Western co temporal concepts of, um, you know, uh, of, of thought. And, and that, so to go beyond visibility, um, it's not only in the contemporary, you know, but if we think about um, historical African art, the uh, creative um, output of indigenous Africans, uh, that also blew the minds of, you know, Europeans in, in Africa. And I think that, um, that today what we see is really this um, disruption of, of the European European canon and of art his, of the art historical canon. And, you know, and this happened in, in a disciplinary sense where, you know, art history went on one path and visual culture and visual studies emerged on another path to show the intersectionality of art with society, with culture, with history, et cetera, as opposed to, you know, art history's focus on um, aesthetics and, um, you know, aesthetic content and, and strategies only. And so there has been this rupture within the discipline itself. But if we were to look at, you know, the canon, uh, I think that what African artists are, have done is to almost, you know, make the canon um, irrelevant, you know. There are many artists, yes, like Indy Wiley, who, you know, have challenged the canon and have taken on those great masterpieces, etc. Um, you know, Yinka Shanibari's work, uh, his most recent exhibition has been about, um, you know, both claiming his own um, cultural heritage in, in African art and, uh, and African sculpture in particular, but also, you know, um, uh, focusing and shining a light on how, you know, the very qualities of African art, you know, it's, it's, it's abstraction, it's, um, you know, it's uh, ab ability to m metamorphosize and change things, you know, it's, it's ability to synthesize human and animal forms were, you know, were, were uh, mined and, and the inspiration for breakthroughs, major breakthroughs in the work of modern artists like Picasso and Modigliani, et cetera. So I think that, you know, if we really want to follow this kind of decolonial agenda, we have to start thinking also about um, the canon as almost irrelevant. You know, and and to invent and create uh, from by theorizing from the artists that we've we've mentioned, um, and theorizing, you know, um, a new a new way to understand um, uh, art practice and and art history. So for me, um, decentering that canon is what you know these artist practices have been about. And I think it's important that we continue to um, decenter uh, the canon in, in our own writing, in our own thinking, in our own research, in our own teaching, um, because that's what's you know exciting about what artists are, are doing. Um, and I, I also want to say that, you know, we've seen many more women artists from Africa. We've seen um, in, in terms of you know, media and style, more, more figurative painting and performance and installation-based work, uh, as well as sculpture. And, and in terms of themes, uh, you know, there's been this expansion also of, you know, really taking on um, uh, temporality. In, we see this in Afrofuturism, you know. We've seen um, uh, recuperative and restorative and healing practices that are rooted within uh, historical African art practices and synthesizing that with, you know, contemporary um, 
healing modalities to really respond to and address uh, conflicts and crises, both past and present. We've also seen artists take on, you know, Africa's role in world making, Africa as a world maker, you know, and not Africa defined by the world making agendas of, you know, Europe. I, I couldn't agree more, to be honest. And I think that's a really, this, um, uh, what you described as thing of decentering the canon, of breaking that apart, making that irrelevant, of utterly expanding and allowing us, <laughs> obliging us really to think way beyond that. I think that's absolutely, I think that's absolutely and, accurate. And I, and I think the European canon has been very productive for artists too, for African artists yeah. too. You know, yeah. it's, it's been really productive and generative and has really, uh, you know, um, opened up the space of reinvention, you know? And so I, I think that, um, that it's almost been a source, a material source for also, you know, generating um, new artistic languages and and strategies. I mean, look again. I would agree with that. In as much as, if you want, you know, the original presumption around African art is that it's other and that it's naive. The if you know anything of Africa, you know it as a place of sophistication of hybridity, of all of these crossovers and connections, all of these relationships to different countries and territories within the continent, but also to the West that have been in play for hundreds of years. And you're absolutely right. This is some of the territory that, um, you know, actually all of these artists explore. None of them begin from a presumption of purity or of absoluteness. They begin from uh, a kind of cultural heritage of syncretism, of hybridity, of, yeah. Of, of, entang of, of entanglements, you know. Exactly. Uh, ours is yeah. one of, I mean, I think our cultural heritage is also one of entanglement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, Moyo, does that? Yeah, I, 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 I enjoy the idea of decentering and disrupting and uh, uh, um, all of that. But why do we have to be the ones doing this? Why, why is it always our duty to, um, to, to, to be the interrupter? Why, why, why is it that uh, um, it is not our space? We have to find a way to move from the margin to the center of it. Why, why do we always have to carry this load? Why, 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 why is our humanity so belittled that we have to fight to say our lives matter? Is it because we, we just innately are not human enough to be visible, to be treated like part of everything that we have always have to decenter and fight and disrupt. Why is this space not neutral? Um, and uh, we, we, we could say that, well, that's just the way the world is. Uh, but why must our artists always be the ones doing all this heavy lifting? I suppose. Look, th there's a point. There's a point that Natasha made, which is that, and I'm paraphrasing you, Natasha. But this is that the, 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 the Western canon has actually been quite productive for a number of artists. If we look at, yeah, again, many of these artists that we can name, I might cite John O'Confra just because, as a filmmaker, the work is absolutely engaged with these entanglements and seems to work with those, not from a point of reluctance, but really a kind of um, a desire to absolutely dive to the heart of these issues. I'm not sure if he necessarily feels forced and pushed into a corner and having to react. More that the assertion of space is to do with saying, look, if I hold the centre here, I'm going to ask the questions. 
I'm going to look outward and say, this is how I see, this is what I want to explore. Perhaps this is a way of reading some of the work rather than just the, we have no choice but to exist in the margins and then shout as loudly as possible. I, I mean, I, I take a more um, optimistic view of um, what you described Mario, as, you know, this, this burden in the sense that I think, you know, um, that uh, when, when you look at our history, you know, um, in Africa, you know this this we have a, we have both the history of struggle and we have the history of you know revolution and we have a history of um also uh you know what is um resilient and what is uh you know strong and um joyful and and all those things together and I mean, I, I'm I'm quite you know proud of of the boundaries that artists have pushed and and broken, but but also you know all, all of this is is also within the history. You know, we've we've always had to um, break boundaries. We've always had to disrupt. We've always had to make uncomfortable, because you know as long as we have these totalizing structures as long as white supremacy exists as long as patriarchies exist as long as cultural othering exists you know the these are actually the boundaries for for me it, it is about you know um tearing down those walls so that we can actually exist in a space of um uh neutrality and you know um uh, coevalness and uh you know possibilities and so we have to keep tearing down these walls and you know I, I i think artists are um you know taking on these kinds of hegemonic ideas or or you know dominant practices and and really kind of picking it apart you know to to explore this new new possibilities um you know a recent show that was quite interesting for me uh, was by um an, an uh, Zambian artist who lives in South Africa, Nolan uh, Oswald Dennis, where, you know, he took on the globe as a concept and as a reality, you know, um, and, and, and articulated different perspectives on something so familiar to all of us, you know, this, this globe that is a kind of given, to imagine new possibilities for conceiving of the globe. And so for him, there was a logic to colonial cosmology that insisted on the universal universality of the Western world, and it's that very universality that I see artists over time have, you know, kind of been chipping away at and and trying to break down, and and that that world created a planet that was defined by you know private property, by social violence, by all kinds of crises, and. And in, in this sort of creative and imaginative um, practice, was he was putting forward that they, were, even within that, there are other worlds that occupy the same space and time as that you know colonial planet, as that colonial globe. So I see that you know that artists are doing the work of bringing us to that place of um, you know. Uh, of, 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 as I said, of, of you know, coevalness, of, um, of synchronicity, of simultaneity, and of contemporaneity, because this was essentially what was denied um, Africa and African people. Um, you know, the way in which uh, racial difference is tied to the denial of our coevalness with other um, people. So, for me, I think that there's this long evolution, but you know, it's transhistorical. We've always been picking away at, uh, you know, whether it's the oppressors, whether it's oppressive ideas, practices, policies. This is what we do, 
Yeah, I understand. This is what we do. Um, uh, we turn our artists into soldiers. We we become fighters. Uh, whereas the quote unquote mainstream don't have to do that. They 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 they, they can just express themselves freely. They don't have to take on issues. And that's what I do in my art. I don't take on issues. I'm free. I, I don't have to deal with any fighting. I don't need to fight anybody. I, I'm not interested in this breaking down of walls and so on and so forth. Nobody can create a world around Africa. No, it's not possible. All of these, I believe, are imaginary constructs like modernity, contemporaneity. Oh, you guys are primitive now. So we have to argue all of that. We are not primitive. So they, then they throw another one at us. Um, you are, are, are pre-industrial. Oh, we are not pre-industrial. So we just keep breaking walls and they just keep building walls. And um, we did not invade anybody. We, 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 we were in our space. And at this point, I think uh, the African artist has to be careful not to be made into this, this fellow who has constantly to defend themselves. And um, uh, in, in the history of African art, uh, take Nigeria, take Ghana. Um, first of all, we had to prove that we could draw like um, the West. And we have Akiola Lashikan, um, Onobolu, and all of them who um, uh, had to paint like the white man could paint so that they could show, show that they could demonstrate, they could do it too. Um, and that, that basically has defined the history of, of African art. And um, so this constant defending ourselves bores me. Um, we are human like anybody else and we can just do whatever we like without bothering about some global space. No, our space in Africa is our space. We, we don't need to now uh, have to engage. They're not engaging, nobody's engaging with us. We are the ones engaging, they come. Picasso came and went to Trocadero, studied these things, stole a couple of images, took to his museum, uh, to, to his studio, and began to transform Western imagination with those images. And for a long time, he even denied it for years, for, for for a long time, he said no. He wasn't. It wasn't like that. It it was not until the thirties started doing it. Le uh, Demoiselle d'Avignon was uh, 1907. It wasn't until the thirties that he finally said, "Okay, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I did that." But for I us, I, I guess, I guess to some extent, how does that change? I think that this, this freedom that Moyo is articulating and fighting for, um, you know, the freedom of the artist to create, um, free of all these constraints, etc. I mean, I, I think that um, the two things are not, uh, it's not, a, it's not a dichotomy, it's not a binary, it's not on either side, you know, you're either fighting against, um, uh, you know, Western constructs or whatever, or, you, or, or for women or, you know, etc. 
um, and, or you either free and and uh, free to make without constraint and without having to deal with issues, etc. So, you know, for me, it's not so much about one or the other, but I I actually think that the freedom is in the making. And so when artists are creating, the very act of creation, the very act of drawing, of painting, of thinking, of sculpting, whatever it is, that that is where the freedom and the agency lies. But as soon as you walk out the door of your studio, you're a black man walking down the street in, you know, a culture or a society that is um, anti-black, you know, that is biased, that is unequal, etc. But I think that what artists do, whether one is a writer or a musician or a visual artist, is to find the agency and the freedom in the making of the work, in uh, the creativity and in being a creative um, uh, uh, and in being a creative. Interestingly, uh, again, I would agree with that. I would suggest what artists do exactly what Moyo is saying. I think artists do, artists are, artists create on their own terms. But by, but what happens by extension from that is that they also create space around them. They create space around them for others to look, be inspired by that work, or, or to use that as a way to navigate space, to question territory, to explore questions around power, position, race, white supremacy, all of these things. So yes, it's not the function of the artist to stand in a corner to defend that territory. But what it is, I'd suggest, is the outcome of that work, uh, and here I'm agreeing with Natasha, the outcome of that work is that the rest of us find some shared territory that's not a colonized space, that to you know use the terms of, of this talk, is a decolonized space, is a is the space of freedom and liberation that you're quite naturally asserting. Oh yeah. Well, <clears throat> why do we need to decolonize? is because they colonized. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So oh, yes. it, it's, it's all of these just creating boxes so you can break it. Um, truly, truly, the term colonize itself is this sanitized term that belittles what the West did to Africa by using that deodorized term colonize. Uh, it sweeps under that sweet sounding term. And at, at that time, they actually had uh, colonial offices and so on and so forth. It was a great term. Um, but what really happened with that term is difficult to even begin to comprehend. And the repercussions are still continuous. So, um, so, so these terms like modern, contemporary, decolonize, and so on and so forth, I'm not comfortable with just because when I think in my language, which is Yoruba, I don't have to deal with any of those. I'm a human being. I have an entire world view that is philosophically grounded in the ecology of my environment. And it makes sense to me. And I totally agree with Natasha in the sense that the artist actually when you come to think about it, are practicing. And the, 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 the praxis, the, the, the very practice is an exercise of their humanity. They really are not dealing with anything. But when the art historian then comes in or the critics then comes in and begins to talk about uh, 
um, how this disrupts that and interrupts that. And the, the artist also learns that language. That is when it begins to get problematic. Um, just the fact that I can pick my pen and write whatever I think or say whatever I want is a sufficient demonstration of my freedom or to paint or to sculpt or whatever it is. It sufficiently demonstrates that. But when they're now saying that what I'm doing is decolonizing, then it means that I have agreed, first of all, that I have been enslaved and now I'm breaking out, but I, I've never been enslaved. Um, whatever it is that uh, um, they have done uh, really uh, is totally inconsequential to my humanity, it does not touch my humanity. And uh, 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 there is the there is that space of spirituality that nothing can penetrate. And I think that is the space from which the artist operates. Well, Moyo, what you are articulating is really a, a humanist racial ideology, you know, a belief that um, black people fit with people of all races and that their racial heritage has a value in society and that one's race shouldn't exclude one from being part of a larger community, but that, uh, you know, um, at, at, at heart, it's, we are all part of this, you know, human um, uh, heritage. And so I, you know, I, I, and I totally, I can, I totally understand that. And I think, you know, sometimes I ask myself this question, you know, if um, just as a sort of thought experiment, especially when I'm having to write something, you know, uh, to ask myself, um, you know, just if, if just to imagine that none of these things mattered, you know, that race, my race didn't matter, my gender didn't matter, where I come from didn't matter, my language didn't matter my social economic, like if none of these things actually really mattered, you know, um, what would I want to write about? What would I want to explore? What would I want to be? What would I want to do? And, um, you know, and as, as much as I sort of pose that question, you know, uh, for me, it's actually, uh, it, it ends up becoming uh, much more restrictive than if I simply write from being a woman, from being a woman of color, from being, you know, uh, a South African living in the U.S., from being, you know, somebody who is really interested in African artists and what they have to say. Um, and so it, it's just, you know, it's just sort of interesting, um, I think, to, to see that inside and outside, you know, what the way which you are articulating this humanist uh, philosophy, um, but also this sort of interior, you know, like I was saying at the beginning that Eko's question opened up this question of interiority and exteriority. Um, I mean, look, let, let, let's come back to that from a slightly different position. Both of you are scholars, curators, I mean, Natasha, you know, inaugural curator of African art at the Fine Arts Museum in San Francisco. Uh, it's a position you've held since 2020. What's the strategy there then? With with all of this that we've said, with all, with all of your responsibilities, all of Moyo's positions, what's your strategy then uh, in terms of curating uh, that department? Well, you know, I have always seen myself as a, um, as a, as, as, a translator in some ways, um, you know, a, t a translator in the sense of, um, you know, where, where I'm from in South Africa, um, in, in the Western Cape, um, and I was born in the 70s, so, you know, I was maybe 20, 21 when apartheid ended, and I'm from a group of people who were classified under apartheid as uh, colored, um, meaning in between of, of mixed race. And 
And it's, you know, it's not simply that one is uh, from a kind of white and black background, but that you are mixed for centuries, you know, from the time the Portuguese, the Dutch, the British, the French, you know, etc., arrived on the shores of Cape Town, that for centuries, one is from a group of people who are culturally mixed, culturally in between. And I've sort of embraced that. And, you know, even in my position in the US, I've always been between the US and between Africa. And I have seen for myself, my role and my practice is to be somewhat a translator of, um, of, of culture, but also of artist practices. And um, not only between, you know, two continents necessarily, but between, you know, the space where I'm making an exhibition and the public that is around that space between, in, in this case, the institution and, and artists, as well as um, the audiences for that institution. And so for the first time, I'm actually responsible for a collection of indigenous African art, of historical African art that was collected, um, you know, in the 19th, in the, in the sort of, let's say, late 19th, early 20th century by um, Europeans in, in West Africa. And so that is, that is the collection. It's a collection, um, like any collection that was, um, you know, uh, um, put together by various people and it has like any collection has it has its um, you know its masterpieces it has its um, gifts and donations and new works that come in it, you know so it has all the um, operations and, and, and objects within a collection and so you know for me coming into um to that space is to really just ask many questions, you know, to try to understand how the collection comes about. What are the artworks within the collection? Um, what, are, what are the individual stories that, you know, may be there that may not be there? And, you know, how to, how to think about this in a kind of decolonial way, you know, how to uh, curate, and uh, work with a collection where I have both my eye on a kind of decolonial practice, but I also have my other eye on, you know, the value of the artworks themselves and, uh, you know, what, what we could learn from, from those works and what kinds of stories we could tell about um, African art objects. So right now, um, you know, I have probably more questions than I have answers, but that's how I, um, you know, that, that was how I defined my approach, that I think we need to ask questions of these collections, even if we don't have the answers, and we need to invite different perspectives and current and new perspectives on collections of African art, because there are many artists who find collections of historical African art really fascinating and interesting and you know what what is it about those collections um that artists are uh interrogating and investigating you know and so um what i hope to do is both uh look at the permanent collection um ask questions about it um and bring in uh, contemporary artists who are also asking questions about permanent collection works. So, you know, that is um, the sort of task that I've set for myself and all these questions that we ask and come into play there because, you know, how do we both critique but also respect the, um, the, the, the culture of Africa? And so, you know, I think that with thinking through these questions with um, different thought partners um, that I've also invited in, uh, different art historians, uh, curators, um, and, uh, you know, just cultural practitioners who are working on the continent in here, but also really thinking through this with artists. Um, and that's, that's where I think, you know, I want the public to be able to also ask questions and to understand um 
that there are many ways to interpret, to look at, and to question um, the collections that are in um, historically uh, European or, or North American um, institutions. So I, I hope that answers some of that question. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly does. Look, we're, we're running out of time, so one last question that I want to direct towards you, Moyo, just as we wrap up. Look, the title of this talk, Decolonizing Aesthetics in Contemporary African Art. Is there any element of that as a phrase that for you is useful? Um, very much so. Uh, I, I saw uh, one, uh, also Basquiat uh, uh, performance uh, drawing and uh, uh, he wrote free Mandela. Um, and uh, I started thinking, you know, so once the free Mandela, what are we gonna talk about now? Uh, and uh, uh, the, the idea of decolonizing, I think came up mostly because the West introduced the concept of colonizing. And um, um, for me, that is not uh, an, an idea that I, I would prefer. Uh, uh, in the early 90s, I came up with this term, semi-optics. Not semiotics, semi-optics. And this idea is to engage the visual in terms of what it means, not only just to the visual, but to all of the senses and the way those relate to the larger community. And uh, uh, such terms for me are much more meaningful than uh, terms that are necessarily just based on reaction. And um, there is this book um, that uh, was published uh, late last year, Letter Modernism, The Future of Theory. And uh, the writer, Jason Ananda Josephson Storm, wrote to me to say that uh, when he was, and he's a, he's a professor, he's a, he's a very, he's an endowed professor um, in Virginia. And uh, he said when he was a graduate student, he read two essays that I wrote in which I talked about metamodernism in the relationship to uh, the art of Africans and the African diaspora. I think I started using it um, when I wrote this essay about the work of Adrian Piper uh, in 1999. I think those things are much more, for me, uh, interesting than for us to be following and be um, engaging or uh, uh, to be uh, posting, uh, decolonizing, and so on and so forth. I think we are free. And uh, uh, for me, it, art is about play. Uh, you play with things. And um, when it goes beyond play, um, I, I lose interest in it. Natasha. I, well, I guess in closing, I would like to say that, you know, African artists um, and my work with on African artists, I think what they are um, doing and leading the way is in helping us to imagine um, art histories, you know, museums, art spaces, in which we are able to recognize the consciousness and life force of everything around us, people, places, things that are all alive and all worthy of respect and consideration and love. And so, you know, to come full circle to, to Moyo's humanist ideology, I think we're all working in different ways toward that end. Uh, um, thank you so much, Natasha Becker, Moyo Okadiji. You know, 
Catholic and Churchill derived around freedom, liberation, consciousness, life force. This seems to me a fantastic, productive place to end a fantastically productive conversation. Thank you both so much. And I hope and thank you all for listening. Thank you, Ekao. Thank, thank you, Moya. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.